Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. I'm very excited to do today's episode because we're going to talk about walk-ins. I've had several requests in my group and in chat on YouTube to talk about walk-ins, but I really wanted to read Ruth Montgomery before I did it. I had just a very basic understanding, and we hear about walk-ins in the Law of One from Ra when they talk about Abraham Lincoln being a walk-in. So the question is, what is a walk-in? What does it mean? And it has just huge implications on what we've been talking about because it's another level of starseed and there may be bad and good walk-ins. And I will read some different passages from stuff that I've found and kind of try to break down what this stuff means. There's a bunch of different terms that I found like soul braiding and a bunch of ways of understanding the universe and the way that our history has been in different figures in history. And I just wanted to share it and add it to our understandings. As I read this information, I started to get goosebumps and really started to ponder, do I know any walk-ins and am I a walk-in? Are you listening to this a walk-in? I mean, it's certainly possible that you were attracted to this episode purely because you are a walk-in. And as a walk-in, you knew that you needed to hear this episode to reawaken certain memories. I became even more interested in walk-ins when I was watching Drinvalo Melchizedek's seminar, the Earth Heart seminar, and he They ask him who he was and where he came from, and he claims to be a walk-in that is 70 years old in body and 39 years old since he's been on earth and explains that he had done some training in Pleiades and on Venus before returning after a couple of different incarnations. So then you start to really think, are there a bunch of walk-ins? Is it a regular phenomenon? What does it mean? We are in a battle between what appears to be good and evil and then other higher sources say, oh, it's not even a battle at all. But there's definitely the yin and the yang, the polarities of this particular density are very strong. And so it is likely that there are negative and positive walk-ins. And I've met people that have had huge transformations in their life where we talk about identity shifts And I have had a huge transformation in my life. Could it be instigated by near-death experiences? Or if you reach a point in your life and you feel it's hopeless that you invite another soul to take over from a higher density? That's what we're talking about with walk-ins. That another soul can come in and walk in essentially to your incarnation. And the other soul either stays or goes on and we're going to actually try to figure out where the other soul would go because i believe that the law of one sort of answers this question because it made me ask questions am i me because as ruth montgomery explains you have the same memories when you are a walk-in and there's a process when the walk-in takes over and so we're going to talk about this and prepare to have your mind blown or maybe it's all bs who knows But Ruth Montgomery is one of my favorites. She was a journalist, one of uh, the great authorities on psychic phenomenon, who was originally a journalist and started reporting on psychic phenomenon and different things. And she wrote a book called Strangers Among Us, which was really hard to get a copy of because it's out of print. And it has a bunch of interesting material on walk-ins, as well as I have found multiple other books and different resources that I've found on walk-ins. And what does all of this mean? What does it mean to be a walk-in? Am I a walk-in? Are you a walk-in? Well, let's find out what we can discover from some of this classic material. I recommend that you watch my episode on wanderers and star seeds to get an idea of this. That's a really good basic beginning point. We talk about the prevalence 
of reincarnated souls from other planets, other galaxies that are here for a reason, for a variety of reasons, to help raise the density of the planet. And the reason we have this is in numerous hypnotic sessions where people are regressed through past lives, they a lot of times will end up talking to people that are reincarnated from other planets. And it's not just once or twice. Dolores Cannon has hundreds of incidents that she documents in her books as well as others. But beyond the idea of the starseed, perhaps an even more advanced being would not want to jump in a particular body from birth and go through the whole process of being a baby and then being a child. I'm sure at a some point where you have a high enough density, you would choose to walk in in agreement with the other soul, possibly as I understand it. Ruth Montgomery writes, The Mystery of Walk-Ins. There are walk-ins on this planet, tens of thousands of them, enlightened beings who after successfully completing numerous incarnations have attained sufficient awareness of the meaning of life that they can forego the time-consuming process of birth and childhood, returning directly to adult bodies. A walk-in is a high-minded entity who is permitted to take over the body of another human who wishes to depart, since a walk-in must never enter a body without the permission of its owner. This is not to be confused with those well-publicized cases, such as were described in The Three Faces of Eve and The Exorcist, in which multiple egos or evil spirits are vying for the possession of an inhabited body. The motivation for a walk-in is humanitarian. He returns to physical being in order to help others help themselves, planting seed concepts that will grow and flourish for the benefit of mankind. Some of the world's greatest spiritual and political leaders, scientists, and philosophers in ages past are said to have been walk-ins, but during these final decades of the 20th century, the pace has been steadily accelerating, and many more of them are entering mature physical bodies to prepare us for the shift of the earth on its axis at the end of the century and the new age that is dawning. Not all walk-ins are towering leaders. Many are working quietly among us, going about their unsung task of helping us to understand ourselves, to seek inner guidance, and to develop a philosophy that will sustain us through the trying times ahead. You may know a walk-in in your own office or in your community. They seldom reveal themselves, because to do so would imperil the good work for which they returned to physical being. In fact, you yourself may be a walk-in, since the memory pattern of the departing entity survives intact. Walk-ins are sometimes unaware of their altered status for several years after the substitution has been effected. Why have you never heard of walk-ins before? That is exactly what I asked myself when, while recently reading a stack of fan mail, I found the attention riveted by one paragraph in a beautifully written letter. My unknown correspondent, after mentioning that she was disappointed in having found no new book by me for the past two years, wrote, Are you looking for ideas for future books? I would like to see what your unseen friends, meaning my guides, have to say about the role of walk-ins on the planet. As they will tell you, a walk-in is a highly evolved entity who always, with permission, enters the body of a human who wishes to check out before completing the tasks he has begun. Sometimes the human has lost heart or had taken on a task more difficult than he was prepared to handle. Sometimes it was the purpose of the departing human to begin the task and prepare the body for the new entity. The walk-in first completes the tasks of the body's previous owner and then goes on to do what he must do on his own projects, which are really those of a gardener who plants seeds on the planet, helps those seeds to germinate, and then lets them grow 
in their own direction. If you ask your unseen friends, we'll tell you more. They will also mention political, military, spiritual, and philosophical leaders who were walk-ins, who inspired or led people, and who are remembered for what they started. Perhaps it is time to tell the story of these remarkable beings who are human while they are among us and who help us along the way in our own evolution. Wow, the very idea was enough to blow my mind. In my long and laborious journey from a skeptical syndicated columnist on politics and world affairs to a writer on subjects beyond the range of our five senses, I had finally become convinced of reincarnation. I had also come to accept that spirits, under certain circumstances, can briefly materialize before loved ones and then eerily dissolve. I myself have never seen a spirit or heard other world voices, but there no longer seems any reason to doubt the veracity of those highly credible persons who insist they have. But walk-ins? Human beings of flesh and blood who walk amongst us, confidently occupying a body that previously belonged to another? It seemed rather much to swallow, yet the thought continued to tantalize my waking hours and even to color my dreams. The correspondent, obviously well-educated and intelligent, had indeed planted a seed, and after several days of restless wandering, I finally decided to seek counsel from my guides, those unseen spirit friends who have been dictating through my typewriter from time to time since 1960. Readers of my previous books in the psychic field are familiar with Lily, the mysterious spirit who directs my automatic writing, and with Arthur Ford, the famous American medium who joined Lily in my charmed circle of spiritual advisors after his death in 1971. They know that each morning after meditation, if I lightly rest my fingertips on the typewriter keys while still in the alpha state, the guides write their messages and profound thoughts through me. Afterward, on reading what they have written, I am invariably impressed by their far-ranging knowledge and by the accuracy of their verifiable statements, but I must confess that of late I had grievously neglected them. For one reason, my fingers were blistered from an unknown allergy that rendered them too sore for typing. For another, the guides had been persistently urging that I write a book to help prepare readers for the coming shift of the earth on its axis, which they say will occur near the close of this century after a devastating war. The thought to me is a chilling one, and since the guides had touched on the subject in the closing chapters of the world before, I felt deep reluctance to pursue it. Could my unwillingness to cooperate have precipitated the allergy? At any rate, the more the guides persisted, the less tractable I became, until I eventually ceased the morning sessions altogether. Then came the challenging letter from my unknown reader, whom I shall call Laura, and after mulling it over for a few days, I returned to the typewriter to consult the guides. Are there, I asked, such things as walk-ins on this planet? And was there any truth to the letter that I had received? After my usual period of meditation, with eyes still closed, I touched the keys lightly, and the guides began to write. The so-called walk-ins are superior souls who have gone on after many earthly lives, and some of them need not return, but are doing so in order to help others. They wish to avoid returning as babies and enduring the childhood state in which valuable time would be wasted. So they indeed take over, with permission, the bodies of discouraged or willing souls who are ready to depart. Some are able to go directly to the purpose of their earthly return and have become philosophers and research scientists, while some are as yet unaware that they are not always in the bodies they now inhabit. They make up a small but brilliant portion of today's society, and they will come in increasing numbers as the earth approaches the shift of the axis during the last part of the century. Now, obviously the shift never happened, 
that she keeps on mentioning about the axis. Perhaps something was done to stop it, or perhaps it was completely false all along. But she goes on to say, in past centuries, walk-ins have flowered and waned and come again, and they are a prime example of the immortality of the soul. Thus, those who attain to a sufficiently advanced level need not repeat the learning processes of birth, babyhood, and schooling in order to serve others. By electing to enter directly into an adult body no longer wanted by the occupant, they bring with them a deepened awareness, a fresher recollection of Akashic records and goals to be reached, and are able to communicate personally with other earthlings, unlike the spirit entities who are ever present but seldom seen or heard by those in physical body. Here, then, seemed verification of the letter that had arrived at such a propitious time, when I was devoid of fresh ideas and seemingly on a dry plateau. But why had the guides never mentioned walk-ins to me before? Because we had no intention, they wrote. Off telling you about this subject until you were ready to receive the information and develop curiosity about it. It is an idea whose time has come. After the morning session, I was just beginning to read those words when the telephone rang. My editor, Patricia Solomon, was on the line asking rather plaintively when I would be ready to get back into harness and write another book. Patricia and I always seemed to be operating on the same wavelength, and after I excitedly read to her the paragraph from the letter that lay open on my desk, she exclaimed, Ruth, you should see my goosebumps. I feel sure that the writer of that letter is a walk-in, although in all the manuscripts I've read in the psychic field, I've never heard of them. The thought that a mysterious walk-in might actually be in touch with me had not occurred until then, but after the guides confirmed Patricia's hunch at the next day's session. I eagerly responded to the woman's letter, making no mention of what my editor and the guides had said about her, but asking if I might come to see her. After a short delay, she graciously gave consent, and two days later, I flew to an area several hundred miles from my home, taking the guides' written messages about walk-ins with me. The guides had declared that Laura is a highly evolved individual who became a walk-in a year ago after the original occupant of the body faced with a seemingly insurmountable marital problem elected to withdraw. Laura seemed stunned as she read these words and refused to confirm that she was a walk-in. But after we had spent several fascinating hours together, her barrier of reticence slowly began to crumble. She said she had certainly not thought of herself as a walk-in when she contacted me, but had felt a strong inner compulsion to write as she did, dangling a carrot to encourage me to investigate a subject that she had heard about. I trusted you and felt strongly that some of your own guides were among a group around my typewriter as I wrote to you, she confessed, whereupon I showed her another message from the guides that said, we have worked with her, Laura, both on this side and since she became a walk-in last year. Laura then said she had been made aware that two of her acquaintances were occupying bodies into which they had not originally been born, but she refused even to consider that she herself might be a walk-in until the evening before my arrival. When two discarnates gave her the identical information that I had just brought her from my guides, she permitted me to read excerpts from her private journal, which described the alteration in her personality and attitudes at the time of her divorce a year previously, and recorded that the evening before my visit, I was told by discarnates that I had taken this body about a year ago. They they who told me said I needed this piece of information before meeting with Ruth in order to field her questions with wisdom for the greatest of all. The new Laura recounted fascinating details of the gradual withdrawal of the old Laura when at time they seemingly took turns occupying the body, although never at the same time until the substitution was completed to the satisfaction of both. But because she could vividly recall details from the old Laura's childhood, 
in college years, she would not accept that the new Laura was a walk-in, even after another walk-in who recognized her changed status explained that there is no break in the memory pattern of the withdrawing entity when the replacement takes over. Since the day when I had the first of many conversations with Laura, I have been privileged to speak with other walk-ins, explicitly identified as such by the guides and by their own inner knowing, and have learned that no such persons should be publicly identified while still in flesh, because to do so could hamper their purpose in return to earthly being. They do not need ego trips. They come not as masters or authorities, but as servants and workers whose task it is to help others discover truth for themselves. It seems that certain walk-ins of the past can be revealed, but only if they are not presently reincarnated, since even that disclosure could affect their anonymity. To illustrate, the guides told me that a genius of the 19th century, whose name is a household word, was a walk-in, and that his inventions, which have revolutionized our way of life, were transferred almost directly from the spirit plane to planet Earth, through the gigantic ability of this man. Yet I am not permitted to reveal his well-known name, because although he died some years ago, he is said to have returned to flesh and is presently engaged in work that should lead to another tremendous breakthrough, this time in the field of medicine. By contrast, the guides readily agreed to name other walk-ins because they are not presently incarnate. Among them are Mohandas K. Gandhi, 1869-1948, who rallied a slumbering giant India to action without benefit of a sword, thereby freeing that nation. Benjamin Franklin, 1706 to 1790, the printer, author, publisher, inventor, scientist, public servant, and diplomat who had been called the first civilized American and America's first world statesman. Abraham Lincoln, 1809 to 1865, taking over from a country lawyer who, after several traumatic experiences and violent headaches, withdrew in favor of the lofty entity who entered that body signed the Emancipation Proclamation and sadly led America in a divisive but necessary war to free the countless souls trapped in slavery. Harvey Firestone, who virtually put the modern world on wheels by pioneering the manufacture of pneumatic and balloon tires. Emanuel Swedenborg, who after having attained the highest pinnacle of scientific fame and proposing all that the world was prepared to understand or conceive at that time, willingly gave up earthly fame and fortune to step aside so that a transcendental soul might use that well-known body to teach the oneness of the spiritual and physical world. The guides say the new entity arrived after the experience in which the original entity, the scientist, saw the heavens opened wide and realized that his own work was satisfactorily completed and that another would further the cause of mankind by taking over his physical body. A prime example of the good that comes from walk-ins arriving fully armed for their work as adults, the guides added. Meister Eckhart, 1260-1327, the German monk and scholastic mystic who taught that the goal of the human soul is union with God. Shankara, 788-820, the dropout, from Hinduism and leading exponent of Advaita Vedanta. Joseph, the biblical Canaan, led with the coat of many colors, who after being sold into slavery by jealous brothers, stepped aside for a highly evolved entity who interpreted the dreams of the Pharaoh and rose to become a wise governor of Egypt. The Christ spirit, who according to the guides became the greatest of the walk-ins at the time of the Nazarene's baptism, when God became manifest in the man Jesus. The guides will have more to say about this later, but it is interesting to note that Edgar Casey, the seer of Virginia Beach, also said that the Christ spirit did not enter until Jesus was baptized by the John the Baptist. My spirit friends say that since a walk-in automatically inherits the memories of the departing entity, he may continue for some time to identify himself with John or Mary Doe. He has replaced, but he will immediately begin to discover within himself 
a new awareness of life energies, deeper perceptions, clear goals, and a love for all beings. The often muddled individual who vacated the body is replaced by one who intuitively knows how to solve the problems that blocked the other's progress. The walk-in for a time may believe that he has simply been granted new insight, and because he has agreed before entering the body to complete the tasks begun by the walkout, few of his associates will suspect the substitution of egos. Yet as time passes and the person becomes more energetic, hopeful, and dedicated, relatives and friends will remark on the great improvement in his attitude. Passivity is gone and with it the previous reluctance to attack new problems and find a way out of the despair or boredom. When such improvement occurs, associates at first will marvel at the alteration but then will come to accept that the person has successfully passed through a period of depression. Gradually, as old projects are completed, the walk-in will move into new pathways and when he realizes that he was not originally born into the body he now occupies, he will be irresistibly drawn to other walk-ins who are already at work raising the level of humanity. In fact, they will seek him out and help him in his adjustment. And what of those who choose to vacate their bodies in favor of a walk-in? The guides stress that a walk-out is not a cop-out. No karmic penalty attaches to such a decision. For unlike a suicide, he is not destroying life. In a world beyond, the guides explained, a soul before reincarnating elects to be born into a situation where he has the best opportunity to pay off old karmic debts and learn needed lessons. They have now lifted another curtain on the mystery of reincarnation by reporting that a soul who has wearied of the debilitating ailments of old age after several lengthy lives, will sometimes volunteer to repeat the life cycles of babyhood and childhood, learning new lessons specifically to prepare the body for a more advanced entity who can enter it as a walk-in. Sometimes they say a walk-in will exchange places with an injured soldier on the battlefield or with a prisoner on death row in order to erase an entangling karma from a previous lifetime when he himself caused another's violent death or injury. Ordinarily, however, the cases are less dramatic. Perhaps a person is discouraged by his seeming inability to resolve a distressing personal relationship, or he may be desperately ill. He may have lost a loved one through death, separation, or divorce, and have thereby lost his will to live. The guides say of this situation, walk-ins are careful not to enter bodies where strong emotional ties to others are still present. In this way, they avoid too close alliances that may get in the way of the pursuit of their higher goals. In fact, those with strong ties to another living person are seldom ready to walk out of their bodies and let another step in. Those who are free from such intimate ties are more willing to make way for another to complete the life cycle of his physical body. Whatever the reason, a walkout has always reached a point of transition before abandoning his body, and whether the person is battered wife, a husband driven to distraction by a carping wife, a cripple, or one who has simply lost the will to live, a walk-in cannot replace him unless he is willing to take over his unfinished tasks and master the problems before launching his own projects. Fully aware of the danger of a disturbed person's mind being taken over by one or more evil entities, I asked the guides how one who was willing to relinquish his body could protect himself from that terror. By remaining God-centered, loving the Creator in oneself and others, they replied, to protect oneself from evil spirits mentally place a circle around oneself, filling it with golden light and breathing into it love and peace. The subconscious is a powerful instrument for helping us picture situations which we wish to develop. This aura of golden light enveloping one in the perfect circle of eternity is important in many ways, warding off evil and filling ourselves with tranquility. It erases fear 
and protects us in his good course to follow each day at the beginning of meditation. When one decides to make his body available for a more highly evolved entity, he should picture himself floating off into space while another sets up housekeeping in his vacated body. This will alert those on his side who wish to become walk-ins and will further expand one's own awareness. It is unnecessary to do this more than a few times before a high-minded entity will begin to make its presence felt. Warmth and love will radiate from it, but the vacator should not practice this unless he has definitely decided that he would like to return to spirit and is willing to present his present incarnation carried on by another. The process is not a lengthy one. Depending on the condition of one's body and the readiness to depart, a few months at most are required by the walk-in to study the Akashic records of the departing soul, determine how to master the body, and understand the best ways for solving the dilemma in which the walkout has found himself. Rereading this message at a later time, I was not sure that the directions were clear, so I asked the guides if they could be more explicit. They wrote as follows, if one wishes to become a walkout, there are several methods to be employed. The wish is paramount for until one willingly relinquishes his body, none other of high moral perception may enter. There is a changeover period during which the ego occupies it in turns, but not simultaneously. As the entity who wishes to enter makes the other aware of his loving presence, they will from time to time exchange places while the newcomer becomes acquainted with the bodily mechanism. This may occur at night during sleep or in daydreams or during waking periods when one is lonely or wretched. To prepare for walk-ins, first surround oneself with a golden protective light. Then, as one begins to feel the presence of another, he may invite him in by taking leave of the body for short periods. The best time for this is while lying in bed or on the floor so that no injury would result from a brief period of unconsciousness while the entity slips into the vacated mind to ensure that the right entity or one on the same wavelength is entering one should remember that this feeling of rightness is the real test if he feels relaxed and comfortable with no sense of panic or remorse it is satisfactory to proceed with the tentative experiment for need not be final until one has said in so many words I will go now and leave all in your hands then he will rest for a time before opening his spiritual eyes to the spirit plane the same day that the guides typed this message on August 23, 1978 an article in the Washington Post reports as follows suicides among young Americans have tripled in the last 20 years about 5,000 Americans between the ages of 15 and 20, four take their lives every year. The phenomenon has affected a startling cross-section of youth from all social, economic, and racial backgrounds. If the guides are correct, then surely the method they describe is a more ennobling way to withdraw from an intolerable situation than to quench the flame of life and incur karmic penalty through suicide. The guides phrased it like this, walk-ins are helping others find their way to self-understanding, quietly assisting them to look within, to find that core within self from which all knowledge flows. They are at work in a variety of ways as physicists, truckers, teachers, scholars, writers, and housewives, for until they are freed of tasks undertaken by the original owners of the bodies, they will not advance their own work which is that of trying to bring peace and understanding between peoples. Those who would contemplate suicide might better give thought to permitting these superior souls to use their bodies and let them take over during sleep or sickness, withdrawing into spirit to rest for a time and reassess their own goals. Why destroy a usable body when it will serve a laudable purpose for another? Why indeed? So why end it when you can just invite a higher entity being to take over your life and fix all of your problems <laughs> possibly this is true i'm not sure so we get more detail about abraham lincoln in particular in the law of one material when they ask questioner wondering if the one abraham lincoln could have possibly been a wonder ross said this is incorrect this entity was a normal shall we say 
Earth being, which chose to leave the vehicle and allow an entity to use it on a permanent basis. This is relatively rare compared to the phenomenon of wanderers. You would do better considering the incarnation of wanderers such as the ones known as Thomas, the one known as Benjamin. Then, in another question, thank you, can you tell me where the entity that used Lincoln Abraham's body, what density he came from and where? The entity was fourth vibration, Ross says. In another question, they ask, earlier you mentioned Abraham Lincoln has a rather unique case. Is it possible for you to tell us what the orientation was and why the fourth density being used, Abraham's body, and when this took place with respect to the activities that were occurring in our society at the time? Ross says this is possible. They then ask, well, in that case, I would like to know the motivation for this use of Abraham Lincoln's body at that time. Ross says the one known as Abraham had an extreme difficulty in many ways and due to physical, mental, and spiritual pain was weary of life but without the orientation to self-destruction. In your time, 1853, this entity was contacted in sleep by a fourth density being. This being was concerned with the battle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness which had been waged in fourth density for many of your years. This entity accepted the honored duty of completing the one known as Abraham's karmic patterns and the one known as Abraham discovered that this entity would attempt those things which the one known as Abraham desired to do but felt it could not. Thus the exchange was made. The entity, Abraham, was taken to a plane of suspension until the cessation of its physical vehicle much as though we of Ra would arrange this instrument to remain in the vehicle, come out of the trance state and function as this instrument, leaving this instrument's mind and spirit complex in a suspended state. The planetary energies at this time were at what seemed to this entity to be a critical point, for that which you know as freedom had gained in acceptance as a possibility among many peoples. This entity saw the work done by those beginning the democratic concept of freedom, as you call it, in danger of being abridged or abrogated by the rising belief and use of the principle of enslavement of entities. This is a negative concept of a fairly serious nature in your density. This entity, therefore, went forward into what it saw as the battle for the light, for the healing of a rupture in the concept of freedom. The entity did not gain or lose karma by these activities due to its detachment from any outcome. Its attitude throughout was one of service to others, more especially to the downtrodden or enslaved. The polarity of the individual was somewhat, but not severely, lessened by the cumulative feelings and thought forms which were created due to large numbers of entities leaving the physical plane due to the trauma of battle. So this would indicate that if you have a walk-in, you're put into a sort of state of suspended animation while the physical body is alive. Ruth Montgomery doesn't go into that kind of detail, but maybe. And then it also says that in this particular case, the entity that took over Abraham Lincoln lost polarity, went down, was fourth density, but maybe a little bit less fourth density because he was involved in that war. So it was a real sacrifice. He sacrificed his own soul and his placement in the universe to make that particular change. Perhaps it helped him in the future. They don't indicate that. In another book by Yvonne Perry called Walk-Ins Among Us, open your personal portal to cosmic awareness. Yvonne Perry explains that everyone likes the convenience of walking into a place and getting instant service. We have walk-in medical clinics and walk-in hair salons where we can obtain services without having to wait. We walk into a restaurant where the server takes our drink order. A few minutes later, we are sipping our favorite beverage and our food comes to the table soon after. In the ideal world, our meals are free. But for now, let's say the check comes without our having to remind the server to bring it or wait for him to return with our change or credit card. A friend of mine told me he walked past a paper that was still rolled up in the protective plastic bag and the words walk in caught his eye. It was an advertisement for walk-in tubs. Really, the water would spill out when you open the door. I'm still waiting for my walk-in closet to start putting in my clothes and hangers, but overall, earth life as a walk-in soul is a grand experience. Even though we do have spirit beings to assist us, souls walk 
into an adult body with all its quirks, conditioning, and dysfunction may not get a grand welcome from humans upon arrival. Certainly not a soul entering as a sweet little newborn. No baby showers, designer nurseries, or parents and grandparents cooing and ooing over us. No, nope. most of our friends and family do not even know we are here, much less that the soul they celebrated when this body was born has left the building. Many times the body that a starseed soul walks into has some type of disease, injury, or emotional imbalance. The natal or walkout soul may have left behind a distressing life situation such as limiting beliefs about him, unenlightened social conditioning or some detrimental or even abusive behaviors in its muscular and cellular memory. Additionally, the walk-in soul may feel disoriented, confused, and confined as it acclimates to expressing itself in a human body. An earth seed soul navigates through life using only the lower three chakras governing survival on the planet. A star seed functions through the upper and lower chakras and is able to access and bring multidimensional reality into its earth life experience. Whenever a new owner takes possession of a property, there is work to be done. The walls may not be painted, the floor may need to be replaced, or the bath or kitchen may need to be completely remodeled. It is often the same with the soul exchange. The incoming soul inherits the decor, trash, weeds, and mess of the former soul. It is the responsibility of the walk-in soul to resolve and transmute the outstanding issues of the walk-out soul before the new soul's mission can begin in full. It is not uncommon for the walk-in to gut the relationships that the first soul maintained. Within the first relationships that the first soul maintained, if you think you are a walk-in, chances are you can look back on your journey and see a time when you went through multiple and sudden changes that drastically shifted the direction of your life. You may have awakened from a coma and realized that you were not the same person you were when you went to sleep. Perhaps a suicide attempt, surgery, a serious medical condition or injury, a near-death experience, or a dark night of the soul preceded these changes. These are common situations that a natal soul may set up as an exit point. Even though things seem to shift very quickly after a walk-in occurs, there's likely a transition period during which the walk-out and walk-in souls temporarily swap places to help both souls get accustomed to their new places and roles. It reminds me of the try it before you buy it concept of an HGTV show called Sleep On It, in which the potential buyer spends one night in a house before making a decision about purchasing it. Anger may be left over from the natal soul. Delight may be the walk-in soul expressing gratitude that the body survived the ordeal and that the transfer was successful. Many people whose soul walked in during a near-death or flat line experience in which the body was actually pronounced dead say that they do not want to be on earth or feel like they do not belong here. To me, this is an indication that either the natal soul's energy has not cleared the brain or the body's cellular memory or that the natal soul did not cross over and is still hanging out in the electromagnetic field of the body it left. A walk-in soul comes from a realm of instant manifestation which does not have the chaos, limiting belief systems and domestication as Don Miguel Ruiz calls it in the Four Agreements of Earth Life. A newly arrived starseed soul can become distracted by all the stuff and not be able to move forward with its mission for many years. Unfortunately, some never do move into expressing their divine mission. Realizing that you have walked in can be the missing piece of the puzzle that helps you untangle the knots that have held you back. A walk-in is a soul that has walked into an adult body rather than the body of an infant. The natal soul, the one that entered the body at the infant stage, normally walks out at the same time the new soul walks in. Unlike the possession that occurs when an earthbound entity forces its way in uninvited, this exchange of souls is done with permission and there are no hostile takeovers. Fortunately, today's swapping and merging of soul essences is not the trial and error cosmic experiment that it seemed to be for many of us forerunners in the 80s and 90s. 
If you are desirous of the spiritual bliss that accompanies a successful walk-in integration, you'll be happy to know that it is not just a select few who are experiencing soul upgrades. Humans are being transformed by receiving into that physical body the energy of some multidimensional aspect of consciousness or a future vibrating at a higher octave version of themselves. The pieces of ourselves that fragmented as a result of the trauma of our belief in separation are also being reassembled as we move away from separation and move toward the oneness and the all that is. This is what some call the ascension. Our galactic alignment exposes us and the earth to its influences of other planets. These cosmic rays introduces multidimensional energy that begins to shift the body to hold universal frequencies of higher octaves. This is having a, a genetic effect upon humans. It is restoring the blueprint of the 12-strand DNA model that was modified eons ago. This modification cut us off from our multidimensional awareness and created duality, right, wrong, good, bad, male, female, causing us to live in the illusion of separation. We are constantly receiving information through our skin, the largest organ of our body, but we are conditioned to believe that if we cannot see, hear, taste, smell, or touch something, then it does not exist. Yes, we know that discerning abilities exist, even beyond our intuition. We are constantly receiving information through the sensory receptor of our skin, which in our divine form was originally part of our autonomic system. These sensors went offline because we stopped using them. Animals know when a tsunami is coming, and they get to the highest hill while humans who ignore their higher guidance stay in the danger zone until it is too late and they get washed away. Humans have never been comfortable with things they cannot explain. Many are not able to accept supernatural occurrences and ideas because they are filters of what is possible to prevent them from believing in something outside of the socially accepted norm. They fear rejection from those who lack understanding regarding the multifaceted soul. They do not know that we are spirit having a human experience. And really that is the most important thing is that we are spirit having a human experience. We are all divine essence. So you may be afraid of this idea and be fearful. There's no reason to be fearful about it. So a couple of different experiences that she talks about are soul exchanges where one leaves and the other goes. One, some are called the death wish in which the person believes and wants to die to be with God or to go home or they do not want to suffer anymore and then somebody switches over there's another idea called soul braids souls are individuations of the divine cosmic intelligence and are therefore multidimensional it may be hard for some to fathom that humans have counterparts that exist in other planes and realms of consciousness so you might have a walk-in that is you the walk-in is just a different version of you and perhaps what we're doing with quantum jumps is we're jumping some version of you into your existence it may be an entirely different version of you it's a walk-in in a different way of thinking because it is you so into the realms of consciousness where there's peaceful cooperation among all beings of light and in this century we are seeing a lot of changes on earth as well as in our experiences as humans one of those changes is incoming of multidimensional aspects of our souls these are called soul braids or walk-alongs in which the energy of an additional soul joins the earth mission, but the original personality soul does not leave. Instead, the two souls integrate. There may be name changes as a result. There are certainly physical, emotional, and cognitive changes. Sometimes companion souls move in and out of the body as needed. One will hold the body while the other takes care of a matter in another dimension or level or vibrational consciousness and then swap places or peacefully cohabitate and collaborate on a project for which both souls are needed. There are times when an aspect of a soul will come to aid the embodied portion of the soul by offering special skills. During times of soul braiding, a person can become very intense and focused on accomplishing their divine purpose to help facilitate their mission. They may exhibit healing abilities, keen psychic sensitivity, empathy, strong and accurate intuition, and other spiritual gifts. 
Soul braids can be formed in any number of combinations. Sometimes a soul braid is an oversoul merge in which a higher aspect of the same soul will download into the body and become part of a life experience, either temporarily or lifelong. There are cases when two or more souls may share a body or its electromagnetic field for a season or a lifetime. Entities which are both detrimental and beneficial soul aspects can attach themselves to the body or aura of an incarnated soul. When a person is abused, a soul can fragment to allow other aspects of their personality to come in and help deal with the stress. Thus, it makes sense that dissociative experiences are part of a spiritual journey rather than a mental or emotional disorder. When two or more enlightened or evolved souls share a body or auric space, there is a kind of cooperation, peace, and harmony that we humans experience when working on a project as a team of qualified professionals. By the same token, there are cases in which we see lower aspects of a soul attached to an influencing and embodied soul. We want to avoid this and free ourselves of the potential for this to occur. When we forgive others, we heal wounds and close the portals that allow such contamination. So the important thing to understand here is that it can be negative or positive walk-ins. Now I'm telling you this and I don't know if it's true. I've connected to my higher self. I believe it's my higher self and I have allowed myself to channel my higher self. And so, yeah, I want my higher self to merge with me. So I'm cool with my higher self is a walk-in. But as I started to do this, I started becoming more and more aware of things and people started coming into my path, especially as my channel grew and my Facebook group grew where I realized they were walk-ins and they're negative walk-ins and their goal is to fight for the service to self path. And if they find some path out there that is promoting the service to others path, they'll show up. And a lot of times they're very intelligent. They'll be on your side. They'll slowly undermine you in some particular way, but they will always appear as friends at first. And so I've had several times when I've seen little examples of this. When my higher self tells me, yeah, that's a walk-in, I almost immediately know. I don't know if you've experienced this, but you can start to see the underlying motivation and that can help you to understand if there's a walk-in involved. But the Ruth Montgomery material goes on further and we can certainly explore that further. But she has a passage, a little note that's read by Benjamin Franklin, who she says was a walk-in. Now it's interesting, the word Benjamin was used by Ra, but I don't know if they were talking about Benjamin Franklin. So maybe he was a wanderer or not, but the guides to Ruth Montgomery said that it was Benjamin Franklin. So, and his awareness is exemplified in a letter he wrote to Miss Hubbard on the occasion of the death of his brother, John Franklin. And he writes, I condole with you. We've lost a most dear and valuable relation, but it is the will of God and nature, that these mortal bodies be laid aside when the soul is to enter into real life. This is rather an embryo state, a preparation for living. A man is not completely born until he be dead. Why then should we grieve that a new child is born among the immortals, a new member added to their happy society? We are spirits, that bodies should be lent us while they can afford us pleasure, assisting us in acquiring knowledge or in doing good to our fellow creatures is a kind and benevolent act of God. When they become unfit for these purposes and afford us pain instead of pleasure, instead of an aid, become an encumbrance and answer none of the intentions for which they were given, it is equally kind and benevolent that a way is provided by which we may get rid of them. Death is that way. We ourselves, in some cases, prudently choose a partial death, a mangled painful limb which cannot be restored we willingly cut off. He who plucks out a tooth parts with it freely, since the pain goes with it, and he who quits the whole body parts at once with all pains and possibilities of pains and diseases which it was liable to or capable of making him suffer. Our friend and we were invited abroad on a party of pleasure, which is to last forever. His chair was ready first, 
and he has gone before us. We could not all conveniently start together, and why should you and I be grieved at this, since we are soon to follow and know where to find him? Adieu, Benjamin Franklin. Those beautiful words written by Benjamin Franklin are a beautiful way of imagining this world that we're in and the life that we have ahead of us. So are you a walk-in? I don't know. Am I? I'm afraid to find out. But as I read this, it did come to my attention that it would be a very effective psychological technique to believe that you are a walk-in, to suddenly believe that you are not the person before, but that you are this high-density being that has extra powers and knowledge and abilities. One of my most favorite techniques and one of the most powerful techniques in all of reality creation is the identity shift. And if you can truly change your identity, as Frederick Dotson documents in his book, Parallel Universes of Self, some people have instantly healed that have multiple personality disorders. When changing personalities, suddenly their limp goes away. One great expert on this is Quasi Johir. Check out his channel. Check out my interviews with Quasi because he's talking a lot about shifting your identity. And check out my identity shift meditation. But to go back to this, the idea that you can believe in that could be very powerful. And if somebody took this on as a very legitimate belief about themselves, it could be transformative, even if it's not true. And if it is true, if there are people out there that really know, then that's fascinating. That's what it appears that I hear when I'm listening to Drinvalo Melchizedek. It appears that he does have this knowledge, that it did come to him. So are you a soul braid or a walk along? All of these different concepts are very fascinating to talk about. And I guess I'll never know. I do feel like a different person, but I still feel like the same person. So perhaps both of me are here. I don't know. I've had some really bizarre moments that I can't explain to you that would not come into words where I felt like I was trying on the body and looking around and tasting things that were really tasty and as if I hadn't been eating food for a long time and the flowers seemed brighter and looking around at things as if they were fresh and new. I've had that and I've had that after going through really, really hard time where I wanted to give up on everything and everything seemed hopeless. So it's possible that this happened to me. And when I started reading this information, it was giving me goosebumps and making me to think that. So part of me doesn't want to know, as they said, maybe you don't want to know. And part of me doesn't want anybody else to know because that can work against you, as it says here. But I just love this kind of discussion. It's very interesting. And of course, I would prefer to not be a star seed. I would prefer to be a walk-in because then you don't have to go through the whole process of being born and learning all those same lessons that you already learned before, which is the problem. Once you've gone through the whole process of incarnating in multiple lives, imagine having to go through it again when you don't need to anymore just to accomplish a particular goal. Imagine if you find somebody that's cool, they have a good situation for you, you come in, you help fix their situation, and then you can achieve your particular goals. I would love to know if any of you think that you are a walk-in. Please, I want to know everything. I want to know what did you go through when you feel like you had your shift? Did the walk-in make themselves known to you? How did you become aware that you were a walk-in? I would love to know everything. Please use the comments to this video to explore this in every way. And I'll be reading as much of it as possible because I want to know what other people are saying about walk-ins and perhaps a lot of star seeds out there maybe aren't really star seeds, but are recent walk-ins. I was sitting thinking about some experiences I had from my childhood, and how vivid they were to me. And wondering if I was experiencing these memories as if they weren't real. And I want to know if I'm a walk-in. Of course, I'm going to fit this idea on either way. That's just how I am when I access information like this. So I hope this helps start the discussion. I may come to this again and explore this further. I believe that Ruth Montgomery has another book where she goes into more detail with specific people that have been walk-ins. But I would want to read that as well. So we'll see what happens and what we find out. But 
In any case, all episodes of The Reality Revolution can always be found at therealityrevolution.com. Join the Facebook group, The Reality Revolution, so that we can discuss these ideas further and you can share your knowledge and we can share it all together. We are a family there. Please leave a review for my book, The Reality Revolution, on Amazon or on Audible, where you can listen to the book and we talk about a lot of the multidimensional abilities that you may have in exploring parallel realities and awakening spiritually. Thank you so much. I am sending out waves of love to everybody listening to this, raising your vibration in every way I know how. My higher self is calling to your higher selves and downloading information to you that you need to completely transform your day and your life. I love you so much. Walk in or not. Welcome to the Reality Revolution. Revolution.